In the spirit of Kujichagulia, or self-determination, the Delta College Department of Ethnic Studies proudly presents Profiles in Equity and Excellence, a virtual presentation series. This speaker series will highlight Black, Indigenous, and people of color who are professionals advancing equity, racial, and social justice efforts in various contexts. All students, faculty, staff, admin, and community are welcome. Profiles in Equity and Excellence features Dr. Chow Danny Vang for session three. Pleasure to basically introduce our speaker. Oh, what a joy. Dr. Danny Chow Vang is with us today, one of Delta's own, certainly. And he is the Director of Educational Equity, Access, and an Equity Strategist at Sacramento State. Um, we're in for a treat. He brings a myriad of experiences in higher education as well as the K-12 system and extensive community involvement, which has allowed him to conceptualize, develop, and implement programs for students to be equipped with the necessary skills, behaviors, and knowledge to basically navigate and function in this complex 21st century context and workforce. He recently authored Ecological Factors in Hmong American Educational Success, a report that informs practices with Hmong college students, which we know is so vital, particularly for our population here at Delta. And his dissertation also received honors by the American Education Research Association for Excellence in Research. Go Dr. Bang. Um, Dr. Bang received his doctorate in educational leadership and policy studies at Sac State, his bachelor's degree at Sac State, his teaching credential at Sac State, and his master's degree. So he was made at Sac State and Delta. So with that being said, Welcome, Dr. Bay. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Dr. Y and Dr. Hollenside for having me. Could you see my screen and hear me? Yes, sir. Perfect, perfect. I also want to give a shout out to Shayla as well, one of my former colleagues here at Sacramento State. I'm very honored uh, to be here. Um, you know, I decided, let me put the port of Stockton on my first slide and say Stockton is where the heart is because I'm a Stockton hometown boy. I'm born and raised in Stockton. Uh, my parents came to the U.S. in 1979. They first settled in St. Paul, Minnesota, which is different weather from Laos and Thailand. They drove their GMC van across the country and settled in Stockton uh, since. So I still go home to Stockton a lot. You know, I go home to Stockton to refocus, re-energize. And a lot of time, it gives me the aha moment as far as understanding what is important. Uh, my parents still live in Section 8 housing in South Stockton. Um, and we have, you know, 10 of us, and I'll uh, share a little bit more about that. But I really want this to be uh, almost like a storytelling, uh, a conversation, uh, because storytelling is very important in many uh, ethnic uh, uh, communities. Uh, for the Hmong community, it's important because we do not have a writing system. So a lot of times, values, cultural tradition, uh, those are passed down from grandparents to parents to nieces and nephew. Um, so I wanted to frame today's conversation and the storytelling uh, format. Another reason is because it centers me as a speaker and immerses you into my world and my journey. And lastly, it counters the storytelling of the majority. Okay, it counters the storytelling of the majority. Uh, and the majority, many times, is from the Eurocentric uh, viewpoint. So I wanted to guide my K-16 educational journey, my career trajectory, the work I'm doing to advance uh, DEI, racial justice, social justice advocacy at the Sac State level, community level, and some of the work I'm doing at, at policy level at the state. And any advice that I want to impart to any uh, you know staff that are just beginning the career, uh, students to identify as first gen, uh, and I wanted to just give you some advice from, you know, my K-16 and now my career as a director of equity access uh, for the university. It's important for me to position myself as a son of refugee parents. My parents came in 1979, uh, right after the war in Vietnam. 
uh, did not speak any English, and had 10 of us. Uh, so I'm a brother to nine siblings. Um, all of them went to Edison High School. So I'm E House, um, South Stockton. I'm uncle to 13 nieces and nephew. I am bilingual and biliterate in, in Hmong. Um, I attended Title I K-12 public school in Stockton. Uh, first gen college student, low income, pay eligible. I'm a former K-12 teacher, site administrator, um, high, higher education scholar, practitioner, community leader, role model, and my grandparents and ancestors throughout the stream, like many of you. I am a beneficiary of education equity outreach efforts. I graduated from Edison High School, and I'll share more about what I was going to do right after I graduated. But picture to your right, uh, I participated in the EOP Summer Bridge Program. It was an early start summer academy that provided first gen students the opportunity to take two courses and kind of you know, start off on a good note uh, to their education at Sac State. Uh, I'm a success of retention strategies through a lot of our equity programs here on campus and the result of graduation initiative. Uh, first time ever in my life helping my dad when I earned my uh, master's. And I believe Dr. White was there. I tried to find the picture that we took together. I couldn't find it. It was a long time ago, over a decade ago. But yeah, it was the first time I hugged my dad. You know, my dad is a veteran, a man of very few words, very few words, like uh, many Southeast Asian parents. Um, they didn't know how to support us, but they, my parents uh, showed up and showed out to support me. I wanted to start my conversation paying homage to my parents. Uh, the picture to your left is... A uh, picture of my dad and mom, uh, their pet dog, and two of my older sister. The day uh, before they left the refugee camps in Thailand. So they had to pack up what they could, uh, get on the bus, get on the airplane, and came uh, and were sponsored by a Christian church uh, to, to settle in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, now, 40 plus years later, picture to the right, our family has definitely ballooned and <laughs> increased. I was highly involved in, in high school. So this is a picture of me. I was a uh, school board representative for Edison High School for uh, Stockton Unified uh, <clears throat> School Board. I graduated in 2005 from Edison um, and you know, my K-12 experience from Fremont Middle School to Hoover Elementary School. Um, and growing up, that's all I knew. So we were on Wake Food Stamps Section 8. Uh, you know, you don't know what you don't have because you just don't know because we live in ethnic enclaves, which meant the grocery store spoke the same language as, you know, my parents. Uh, there is not a need to really leave your community uh, besides going to work and, you know, uh, going to school. My uh, junior and senior year in high school, I work at Taco Bell on 99 on Waterloo for folks that are uh, aware of, of where uh, Taco Bell is. But I was really involved in engaging student government, clubs, and sport at Edison High School. And um, I, you know, I want to say it's because of those coaches and teachers uh, who saw my potential, um, I was able to receive 13 scholarship uh, from Edison. So leaving Edison to Sac State, I received 13 uh, scholarship. And I'll share more um, as far as reflecting back what was missing from a K-12 experience. During that time, Edison was uh, facing a lot of challenges, like many inner city high school, Title I school. Um, in 2007, um, a university in the East Coast uh, did an article and identified three Stockton Unified School District and labeled Edison as a dropout factory, a dropout factory. And many of my siblings, we were not happy because we all are alum at Edison. My oldest sister is a physician. One of my sisters is a pharmacist, two are ER nurses. Uh, we were like, this is not the right narrative, and this doesn't paint uh, South Stockton uh, or re really the youth as having opportunity. So reflecting back, what was missing from my K-12 experience was when I graduated from Edison High School with the accolades and accomplishment, it was either attend Delta College or work at Towards R.S. Because Towards R.S. had a factory in South Stockton at the time. And that's where my brother worked. That's where my uncle worked. That's where everyone worked. Uh, I also realized that my parents spoke no English. So there is a lack of parent involvement. Uh, and because our parent didn't know, you know a system of, of, of K-12 in, in the US, they didn't know how to protest. They didn't know how to maybe uh, go against you know, the recommendation of putting me in ESL courses uh, for all my elementary years. 
Uh, also, we were part of refugee communities. Um, and then the lack of school activities and opportunities at Edison. And lastly, as a Title I school, right. there was none or little college and career access and classes. So reflecting back as a former high school teacher, students were tracked to either take A through G requirement courses so they have a shot to attend college, or really they were put into uh, technical courses so they could just enter the workforce. Uh, so it was almost, you know, a modern day segregation that was happening. Um, but what did, um, you know, work out for me was I had amazing high school teacher and counselor that kept me on track. Amazing, amazing high school teacher and a counselor kept me on track. Although my parents did not speak any English, they were able to uh, support me and all my siblings and other students that attend Edison High School. My senior year um, at um, Edison, a, a, a EOP student, uh, an EOP counselor at Sac State came and recruited me to participate in Summer Bridge. Uh, part of the reason why I came to Sacramento State was I had older siblings. So there has to be some study that says if you have an older sibling that has gone through college or is in college, the likelihood of the younger sibling increases. Um, there's, there was 10 of us. So I had six older siblings already, already in college or completed college. So it was easier for me just to come to Sac State because I had a place to live. If I knew better, and if I had parents who were, you know, educated, um, I believe that my 13 scholarship, I would be able to take it to a, a UC, a private college. But again, I didn't know any better, but I will not take that back. And I do not regret my education I got from Sacramento State. And the value of being involved and engaged provided me awareness. Just awareness is what provide most students the opportunity to take advantage resources. Awareness is also very important still in higher ed at Sac State. I believe when students are aware, we give them an opportunity to choose to take advantage. Um, so awareness was what really provided me looking back as far as my ability to uh, progress in my career to this day. So I received my education, uh, my uh, bachelor here at Sac State in social science, and I minor in ethnic studies. And then um, that's how I met Dr. Uh, uh, William uh, she was one of the faculty uh, in in a credential program. Part of the reason why I wanted to become a high school teacher was because when you don't know better, you begin to look at something to find meaning. So I wanted to hold a radio. I wanted to become a principal because a principal holding the radio was a sign of leadership for me. So I did my teach credential. I did my student teaching at Hiram Johnson, a local school here in Sacramento. And I wanted to go back to Edison to teach. And I wanted to make my way up, earn my strike to become a principal. I wanted to hold that uh, radio. I was able to graduate in four years at Sacramento State. And as many first gen, I wanted to just go back home to Stockton, get a job, help my parents and settle down. So you could see the dollar sign. That was my frame of thought when I was doing my bachelor. I just wanted a job so I could help my parents. I decided to uh, get my master's in curriculum instruction. Um, so I was really focusing on why is that certain textbook, particularly in history, social science, do not include certain groups. So my master was really focusing on how textbook, and really California and Texas, really they you know, lay the groundwork for a textbook publishing company um, to produce text for other states. And I created a unit on Southeast Asian history that is now actually being used in Sac City Unified School District and Elgort Unified School District. And I didn't know the impact and the value of that, but it's been 13 years later and now they're emailing me wanting to use my lesson. But what I did realize as well is, now th these are my lessons about my people and I got to capitalize on it. So now I'm putting it into a unit that can be purchased uh, because a lot of time the work we do, uh, we give it away for free. And I realized, no, this is not fair because this is for my people. So the funding that if I do get from it will go to student scholarship because we, most of the time, we take from the community. It's so important for us to give back to the community. Earning my master provided me more opportunities, but I still had no idea what I wanted to do. It did give me the opportunity to begin to ask the question, why? That led me to earning my doctorate in educational leadership policy here at Sacramento State. Um, as well as uh, a few years ago, I was selected uh, 
by the university to represent Sacramento State to attend the UC Berkeley Executive Leadership Academy Fellow. Um, I was honored in that at the time I felt that I was a the low ranking staff member because everyone was a provost or a dean and was uh, you know on the track to become a president of the university. And here I am, you know, a low totem pole Asian American. I was very quiet. Um, reflecting back, you know, it is definitely imposter syndrome, but I, you know, told myself I'm there for a reason. Is Someone that a character? <laughs> so during uh, my doctorate, I uh, came to this aha moment of now it's about representation. It's also where I had to see it at the table to ask why I'm able to put policy into a practice. And as a researcher, I'm currently doing two research right now to be able to be published with the chancellor's office. So it's it's really a calling for me um, after earning my degrees. So looking back, reflecting back, what educational lessons did I learned from my bachelor to my doctorate? I started at Sac State, and I think Dr. White, uh, uh, Dr. William will remember this. Sac State had learning courses, learning skills. I came to Sac State from Edison, earning 13 scholarship, had a 3.5, thinking that, you know, I was at the height of, you know, you know who I was. I was hit by almost like a, a, a 18 wheeler truck. I did not start in GE courses at all. I was, I was in four LS courses. I remember those courses named LS87, 86, LS7, A, 7B. It's the lowest course you need to take to gain the skills to enter GE courses. And not to my own fault. You just need... I just didn't know any better. So I was a year and a half behind uh, my, my peers entering Sac State. But looking back, you know, my 12 years in, in just, you know, schooling is find your community, your friends, and your supporter. Again, your community, your friends, supporter. For students that are, you know, now in Delta and may transfer, identify a faculty or staff to serve as your mentor. Meet with your advisor and chart your degree plan. I have cousins that are at the community college, been there for four or five, six years. And they're just not knowing what they want to do. It's so important to me with an advisor to chart your degree plan. Attend and participate in events and club, whatever opportunity. I used to be a career counselor with a career center here at Sac State. And many time, graduating seniors come see me the month they graduate in May. And they're scrambling to put the resume together. And I've asked them, you've been here for five, six years. What have you done? And their resume is half a page. You're paying money not just to attend class. You must get involved. You have to know, get to know somebody. Um, so joining a club, attending events will allow you to, uh, you know, make your resume more more robust. Network and get to know people in the community. It's so important. A lot of times, those folks in the community could be your advocate, but also could be your next uh, employer. Find opportunities for development, whether it's personal, professional, or career. I'm a staff member, I'm an administrator, not a faculty. So I'm not uh, required to teach, publish research, but I still do. Part of it is because I know there's a gap in the research that I'm interested in, plus also a lot of time, it provides me an opportunity to teach, to publish, uh, to get my work out there. Although it's not required, it allows me to develop as a scholar practitioner. And plan what is next and get multiple advices, multiple advices. Go to three, four, five people that you trust and get advice from them. One person does not know it all. So this is kind of my student lens of my educational lessons from my bachelor to my doctorate. And I want you to kind of take nuggets what relates or most relevant to you. This is just a quick highlight of my uh, career um, from case, case 16. So currently I oversee eight programs and centers um, here at Sac State as a director of education education equity access and as equity strategist. Um, I listed by as far as some of the, of the larger programs. So paid for partnerships to advance the value of education is a K-12 tutoring program. Um, we recruit and we train and we uh, assign over 100 Sac State tutors to six school districts every semester, not years, every semester. So that is one of the larger programs I oversee as well as the Center for First Gen. Our new upcoming API center that will open next month, it is only one of six in the CSU. Um, so think of opening a center, carpet, paint, 
furniture facilities. So we've been doing that since February of last year. I also provide leadership for our Native Center that will also be opening the first of this kind at Sac State. And we're expanding our MLK Junior Center that I also have opportunity to provide oversight. I provide oversight to Project Hmong, work directly with uh, all the seven colleges where faculty, student mentor program, our executive trainers program, and speak to lead. Um, so these are the work that I you know, support day to day in addition to fundraising. And each semester for the past, I want to say six years, I teach in the Department of Epic Studies here at Sac State and the social science program, a capstone course to prepare students for the credential program who would like to be social studies teachers in high school. I work as a career center at Sac State for um, a year, uh, which uh, led me to depart to uh, my K-12 experience. So these are other things in higher ed. Notomo's Unified School District recruited me from Career Center. Um, I was a teacher on a special assignment or TOSA. I coordinated the entire IB program, also worked with teachers on lesson plan and unit development on instruction and coaching. And I believe uh, there's a reason for everything. This is where my master's in CNI came into play. Uh, I was a behavior technician working with uh, kiddos diagnosed with autism. And I taught at uh, SAC uh, Charter High School and uh, did my student teaching at Hiram Johnson High School. And these are some of the community groups that I'm part of. I'm very proud to be uh, Cal Expo State Fair Diversity Council. Um, as you all know, you know, California holds a state fair for the people of California, but the people of California do not have resource to attend. Where parking is 10 bucks, a ticket is 12 bucks, you know, turkey leg is 19 bucks. How can a family of four who's on food stamp attend? So that's one of the things that I've been advocating is uh, we need to provide a different opportunity or avenue for the people of California to attend the California State Fair. Uh, so that was one of the group that I recently joined a year ago. So again, this is kind of my career highlight and uh, the community work I am. As far as what is next, um, I was telling Dr. Uh, Hollenstein and Dr. White, I don't mind coming back home to Stockton, uh, you know, despite all the news that has happened with the bankruptcy uh, and whatnot. Uh, a lot of people are leaving Stockton, I believe, is causing a brain drain, a talent drain. And I want to come back to Stockton because to me, Stockton is where the heart is. Um, so my career next step, I don't know, but I do know that I don't mind settling down uh, in Stockton. And I want to live uh, in South Stockton. I don't want to live in, in, in any part of Stockton that I may have the opportunity or the privilege to uh, live, but I want to live in South Stockton where my parents currently uh, uh, reside. So what career professional lessons have I learned uh, so far? Uh, and these are more advice is identify a board of directors for yourself. A lot of times we think of having mentors, but I say, you know, as you become and as you elevate in your career, find a board of director. A board of director is anyone you go to if you need to negotiate your salary, uh, if you have relationship issues, uh, if you want to advance your career, if there's, you know, uh, 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 you know, political situation you're in, folks that are expertise in those areas, a board of directors that you go to. I would highly recommend that for any career um, or early professional that I've learned so far. Identify your workplace advocates and allies. Some people may be your ally, but they will not be your advocate. They're not gonna be the one there attending your forum when you're presenting for a job. They're not gonna be there when you're being you know, scrutinize. They may be your ally or a friend from far away, but when it's time to show up and show out, they won't be there. So find those allies, also find advocates. Continuous professional skills development. Uh, I'm part of a different uh, organization and I attend those organizations, the student affairs professional. I'm also part of APAHI, which is Asian American in higher ed. Um, continuous professional development is critical. Uh, and align your work with the organization and your supervisor's uh, mission. Here at Sac State, I know they're very big on graduation initiative 2025, uh, graduate in four years for undergrad, two years and out for a transfer student, but also our anchor institution to ensure that all our talent is immersed and given back to the community. Um, identify your supervisor's area of need and the gap in your organization. That will allow you to come right in, fit, fit right in to be able to kind of elevate the work your boss is doing, your, the unit's doing, or your organization's doing. Listen, and I've learned by watching other, other leaders, be the last one to speak at a meeting or don't speak at all. And that may 
speak more volumes. So listen, be the last one to speak at a meeting or don't speak. I've learned that now I'm an institutional agent because I have access to higher education. Thus, I now serve as a community bridge to many folks. And to me, that's a privilege. And I need to be, uh, you know, be grace in that privilege, but also know that not many people have this opportunity as a Hmong American from South Stockton to be able to have access to information that other folks are not preview to, but also access to change student lives. And to me, I take that very seriously. And also leverage your experience and your intersectional identity. You have to level your experience. At the end of the day, you are a unique individual. <laughs> so as far as some of the work I'm doing to advance diversity, equity, inclusion, and I know that Kaiser lately has been using the word justice, so Jedi. So I wanted to kind of you know preview that. But before I do that, um, you know, the work we're doing in higher ed, we have to understand is from the 1950s, the higher education master plan. You know, education, the UCCSU was not made for people that look like you and I. It was made for people coming back from the war, primarily white men. So that in itself uh, forms the systems in place as far as the policy and practice. And one of the reasons why I work so hard on providing not only outreach, but access. Outreach can be something that anyone, everyone does, but access is the hard part. Access is the hard part. And I'll share more uh, about what outreach means to me in the work I do and access and how all this advances DEI work. So here is an ecosystem. Um, I want to provide the Sac State ecosystem. Um, and this ecological system is very big on a lot of research and a lot of scholars who typically are, uh, are, are you know, uh, framing their work with critical race theory. Uh, my dissertation, I also use ecologic theory to really understand uh, systems. Uh, so you can see here at Sac State, the microsystem is a college portrait. Uh, the faculty and staff, the demographic of student, our community partnership, our offices, our center, that's a microsystem, day-to-day -day operation. The meso system is our university strategic plan. Right now, we're going through a five-year uh, strategic plan. Our president's imperative, one of the big things is uh, our anti-racism inclusive plan, our anchor university, our divisional unit goal. That's the meso system. The influence is the microsystem. The exosystem is things outside the university uh, that aligns our work. The CSU graduation initiative, uh, our equity goals, and our microsystem. Uh, an example could be the American Association of Colleges and University. It could also be WASP, things that dictate the work we're doing. And thing outside does that does not directly dictate, but it does have influence or chrono system, the social economic political climate. Um, hopefully today you all are able to join me to watch the runoff in, in Georgia. All these, you know, uh, that you know affects the state of Georgia, budget priorities, public policy. So this is the ecosystem of higher education at Sac State. I, I want to provide that context before I jump into how I'm advancing or deconstructing some of the uh, these system in the work I'm doing. Sac State, like Delta College, is a minority serving institution, the MSI. Uh, we're both des uh, designated at the HSI and NEPZ and funded. And not every CSU or UC and community college are funded. Um, you may be designated by the number of students you have, but you may not be funded. And there's a huge conversation when it comes to equity is, are you an enrolling institution or are you a serving institution? There's a lot of institutions that are funded because of just the number of, let's say, Hispanic students they have. They're enrolling, but they're serving. So there's, there's a huge conversation uh, about MSIs right now across uh, the nation. So under the institutional level initiative that um, I'm leading or in partnership, uh, focusing on Latinx community, the FEDIA. So FEDIA happens here at Sac State every year. They just held theirs in uh, October. Our, uh, uh, for our Asian American community, we hold a Peter College Day. I serve as a chair of that. Uh, we're going to have ours in March. Super Sunday, Black uh, College Expo, that will happen in February in alignment with the celebration of passing Juneteenth, the Governor Newsom signed two months ago, but also Black History Month. So Sac State will be taking lead in that. And we also have our Native Scholars Day that happens uh, under my area as well. So as far as when it comes to access and retention, uh, we have... I want to say almost, you know, every affinity cultural equity centers 
and program that encompasses whether it's our, our Pride Center, our Women's Resource Center, our Male Empowerment Collaborative. Uh, so here at Sac State, you know, our, our goal is to provide a place for belonging to students, but at the same time, it provides us challenges from narrative saying, why do you have program center for every group? What about our group? So those are some of the, um, you know, things we're working through. Um, one of the things that I'm, you know, very, very big on is our uh, male of color students. Uh, we do have an office for them, but for me, as you have office for them, that also needs to be staffed and resourced. Um, there's almost 15,000 male students here at Sac State, but most of them do not graduate within four years. Uh, so that's an area that we're gonna focus moving forward. Um, at the institution level, I know uh, the university is putting um, you know, a lot of resource into the Division of Inclusion Excellence, which is leading the anti-phrases and plan. Uh, we have numerous employee resource group here at Sacramento State. Uh, the policy area that is near and dear to my heart is data disaggregation for Asian American and Pacific Islander. It's so important because there's over 50 subgroups that fall under this umbrella. Uh, and we have to you know, take in consideration, you know, the Chinese been for 100 years versus the Hmong been for only 30 years, uh, the language and dialect. Uh, so when we're, we're able to disaggregate the data, we're able to zone in which group needs support and which group we should celebrate and learn from. So this is something I know a lot of us at the CSU system has been working on. Um, at the state level, they are slowly disaggregating health data, but educational data in K-16 uh, uh, continues to be a ongoing conversation. Uh, the work I do is very big on belonging. Students have to feel that they belong, but when they feel belong, our student enrollment has to reflect the city demographic. And that's something that we're doing with our outreach initiative, that our number of students here is reflective of the city demographic. But more importantly, our faculty, staff, and leadership also has to be reflective of our student demographic as well. Faculty, staff, and leadership, it's critically important uh, to be reflective of the student demographic. And when I say student demographic, I mean uh, uh, race and ethnicity. So what allows me to uh, stay focused, uh, stay grounded, uh, is this ethos of compassion and community. That really is the foundation of my leadership. Just you know who I am, the way I was raised in refugee family in South Stockton. Compassion, community, it's so important. Like it's so easy for the work I do to be consumed in politics, and that's just real. Uh, it's so easy to be consumed in day-to-day -day budgeting, staff management. So I always tell myself that I must be mission-driven and visionary. The work I'm doing is critical to be servant and relational, innovative, absolutely, and creative. But I got to be pragmatic and be very reflective and strategic in the work I'm doing. So I leave you with, you know, the work I do is service to other, to be empathetic, empowering, and equitable. I, I always, and I know we all have this, but for me, aware of my own blind spot, like when you're driving, you know, you change lane. I have my own blind spot that I need to be aware of, that I need to be aware of my blinkers and my biases. So I wanted to leave you all with that. This is my uh, email, uh, also a picture when, uh, you know, I received my hoodie for my doctorate. Uh, you know, my work, it's the community's work. Um, as I was sharing with uh, Dr. William, opportunity has been provided for me to uh, elevate my career in other institutions and I've had declined. It will not bring me the same joy. It may bring me you know, a larger paycheck, but to me, it won't bring me joy. It will also take me from my community and to see that I have planted in a valley. So I'll leave, leave it at that. <laughs> Oh, you are the truth, Dr. Vang. Let's give him a warm round of applause. Snaps, claps, everything else in between. I mean, I, I know I, I've lost track now as to how long we've known each other. <laughs> but I remain, I remain inspired and just you, you're a marvel in terms of just the, the wealth and the, the range, the depth and the breadth of all that you do. 
So I, I truly am thankful that you are here with us in this space. So uh, Dr. H, we're gonna open it up for some questions and dialogue. Yeah, All certainly. Right. So again, thank you so much for the inspiration and the example that you are setting. You know, I'm looking in the chat as you're presenting and you are amazing. Like, wow, all of your accomplishments, everything you're involved in for one human being to be doing all of this. It's very inspirational and, and thank you so much. Um, what we want to do right now is we want to take a moment to open up um, for our participants the opportunity to ask questions. So... Um, let's get involved for the next few minutes, folks. Um, questions that we want to pose to Dr. Vang, you can either raise your hand. Um, I know that you know quite a few people on, on this um, presentation, some of our participants, if you want to give a shout out, or you can type questions in the chat as well. And I will, um, you know, say them out loud. So questions that we have for Dr. Vang. We'll give everybody a moment. Awesome. And I'm, I'm going to start with the first one. Okay. <laughs> boy, oh boy. So Dr. Rain, how do you personally navigate the rhetoric that comes out of the DEI discourses that we see everywhere within institutional space? Versus the reality facing BIPOC populations on the ground. How, how do you personally navigate that, knowing all that we know about your background and your trajectory moving into these spaces and your ability to um, affect change? No, thank you for that question. You know, I think a lot of time I do a lot of self-reflection uh, when there's announcement of a, a new initiative or a new position. And I ask myself, is this position or initiative a speaking point for the university? Is this initiative or, is, or individual who's appointed there to protect the cabinet or the president? And we have to be frank and very real. Um, and what role do I play in that? Uh, is there any teeth to this new initiative? Or again, is, is it just good PR, right, or or um, good speaking point. I always tell myself in, in, um, in consulting with my mentors in this space is to take, stay true to who you are, um, be able to measure the work you're doing when it comes to DEI. A lot of times it's really hard to measure DEI work. Um, so I take notes in every meeting I'm in, uh, I have a paper trail in everything I do, uh, but also I position and center everything I do on students. I think that if your heart is with the students and you want to do what's best for a student, knowing the political climate, dynamic of folks in the room, it will serve you well. Uh, and it has served me well this far um, in that you know, the work we're doing, it's so important to uh, be able to have, you know, a good reputation, but a track record of success. Um, because DEI work is a calling. And a lot of people think that coming for a year or two, you can make change. It, it's, it's not. It's been hundreds of years of institutional racism and discrimination. So idea of coming in and launching an initiative or folks thinking that you're going to be there for only a year or two and you're gone. You're not going to be able to move the needle. Um, so it's a, it, it's, it, it's, it's the ability to stay on top, on top of things, but also navigate it in a way where, you, you know, you garner the respect of your colleagues, garner the respect of the leaders, uh, and that they allow you autonomy to uh, do what you have to do. Um, and it's not easy. It's very political. Um, and even the work I do, and I give an example of you know the work I do in the Asian American community. Uh, we have very wealthy Asian American, we have very poor Asian American, we have over 40 subgroups that want their own center, their own say, their own event. Navigating that is it's it's difficult, and that now I'm the face of it. So there has to be someone that folks will go after 
and um, express their grievances. And because I'm the you know the few Asian American administrator on campus, I'm going to be the low totem pole for the, that everyone goes to <laughs> that that whether it's good, bad, or ugly. Thank you so Thanks. much. I, I I do want to I do want to note that there was a post in the chat from Shayla Walker who says she has to jump off for a meeting, but it was great <laughs> seeing you. Look forward you, to connecting with you soon, and thank you so much. We have Edison Edison High School alumni in the building, which is Josh. So you know we're giving shout outs to Southside yeah. Stockton, yeah. <laughs> born and raised. Okay, thank you for being here. Here's another question for you, Dr. Vang. What do you look for when looking for a good person to help you with an education plan? I feel like talking to people I really don't know, it kind of make me feel like every other student instead of real one-on-one -on -one help. And this is from one of my students, Anaya Patrick. Thank you for asking. Well, I, I commend you for asking that question. Um, and you know the courage to be vulnerable uh, for many first gen student uh, like me and hopefully like you Anaya, our parents cannot help us. There's really no one that could, you know, uh, tell us what classes to take or map out our educational journey. The advice I can give is continuously go see a faculty, go to office hours, go see your advisor, uh, go see a staff member that you trust. Uh, they will be the one that will help you. Uh, and try to come prepared and having questions ready to ask. For many of us, we're intimidated. One, because we're asking for help. Two, because we don't know what question to ask. So I will come with a few questions in mind or written down and ask the advisor or faculty member or staff member. And I will go to multiple people uh, because a lot of time is not the only right answer to get where you're going. Showing up it's it's more important than not showing up because for me, when I was a counselor at, at the career center, I remember students who show up. So when opportunity comes, I'm like, yes, Anaya, I remember. She told me she wanted to do X, Y, and Z rather than not coming out at all. So just by the act of you going, you, you're, you show that you care about your own educational journey, but you become relevant because now you're in the mind of the advisor. So when opportunity comes, they're like, oh yes, Anaya wanted this and this and this. But do not be afraid because you are the student that are being served by these faculty and staff administrators. Without you, there ain't no financial aid and we got no job. So you go ask your question. Thank you so much. You're getting, you know, some, yes, people agree with that. Um, here's another interesting and important question um, from Dr. Lee Fen. Brain drain in Stockton is very real. Any thoughts on how we retain educated folks here? Thank you for that question, uh, Dr. Fan. I also want to give a shout out to Mini Moa, uh, one of my former uh, colleagues here at Sacramento State as well. Uh, I've, I've noticed his brain drain uh, when I was doing my undergraduate uh, here at Sac State, um, in that it was just people close to me leaving to UC Davis and starting their family in different cities and not coming back to Stockton. And of course, you know, the bankruptcy of Stockton, you know, every city has their challenges, but when we're on the news about shooting left and right, homelessness, our, our you know, politics of Stockton, uh, it doesn't paint a good picture of us. I heard one time that, um, you know, we're almost like, you know, the next, we're, we're like the West Coast Detroit, Michigan. Um, I was a proponent and I was really happy to see the proposal of having a CSU Stockton by, uh, I think some of the member Eggman, they did a, a, a environmental study and I don't think it's gonna um, move forward uh, for many political reasons. People are saying that it may take away from student enrollment at Sac State or Stanislaus State and whatnot. Um, one way is having a CSU Stockton, I would say, um, because not every student from Delta College is gonna enroll to UOP. So if you're home, if you graduate from, you know, uh, any high school in Stockton, you have opportunity to go to the CSU Stockton or go to college or, you know, a pathway from Delta college into CSU Stockton. But that's not the reality. It's not going to happen anytime soon. I think one of the best way to attract talent or retain talent is pay. <laughs> it's pay, I'll have to be honest. It's pay and salary. 
uh, with inflation is pay a salary, but also there has to be high paying jobs and opportunity in Stockton. You know, uh, besides service jobs, uh, you know, there's really not much if you are not in higher education uh, or working for the government. That's really, you know, I want to say some of the top paying jobs is City of Stockton or UOP or Delta College. Beyond that, we have to think about, do we have a population that has education if there are opportunities for high paying salaries? And currently we don't. So, you know, I, for me, for example, I would love, love, love to come back to Stockton, but then I have to think about my career is either UOP or Delta College and are the opportunities there to now meet my lifestyle that I've enjoyed now. Um, and then we also have to look at housing as well. You know, we want, you know, a, a, a newlywed couple with a kid to come to Stockton and, you know, have a white picket fence, uh, middle-class income, they're not gonna be able to afford housing in Stockton. So I wanna say housing, high paying salary jobs and even jobs to exist. And it's, it's, it's gonna take multiple stakeholders, um, but I would, you know, implore everyone who has opportunity to stay in Stockton, stay in Stockton, get involved in governments, get involved in, you know, community service, uh, I still go, I'm actually going to go to Stockton and visit my parents after today. I still go, but I think if the opportunity presents itself, I, I will definitely come back. And I, I know many people will, will come back, but it's just the opportunities of, of, of you know, high paying salary jobs for folks like you, you and I that, you know, may not exist. Mm -hmm. And yeah, one of the responses to, to what you said was, I wonder how remote jobs might transform opportunities locally? I, I, I will say this is uh, my own personal opinion. I'm not a fan of Zoom. I'm not a fan of uh, uh, remote in that it's because of the type of work we do. Teaching, it's feeling by learning, by seeing interaction. Um, that's, that, that's my, uh, my, my, my own view. Absolutely, not everyone's going to be able to work in the space of in person and remote is an option. I'm for it, but then there has to be an employer that exists that does remote work only in Stockton. It may be a calling center, but many of these service jobs or government jobs are not remote. So it becomes a challenge to be able to have remote, high paying jobs for folks who maybe not leave Stockton. Uh, it may be where you live in Stockton and your job is in the Silicon Valley because you're in the tech industry. That may work. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I would like to say Dr. Um, Pablo Ortega is saying thank you, Dr. Vang. You inspire us with your story, advocacy, and knowledge. He has to leave to go to a next meeting, mm -hmm. but says thank you. Th take care. Thank you for presenting. Um, some responses to what you mentioned about the you know, virtual teaching and online. Anaya included that she feels like teaching is more effective in person and relationships form that you can keep with you throughout life. So yeah, definitely. Um, there is another question that um, is interesting and powerful. How can community be created in online classes? It's, it's, it's possible. Um, when I, you know, had to also pivot to online, one thing, and even prior to online, I always spend the first two weeks, and I believe I got this from Dr. William, I always spend the first one or two weeks building a community for students to know each other. Cause we have to realize we have these students and the students have each other for only 14 to 15 weeks. So I always dedicate the first week or the second week of just community building, icebreaker, students knowing each other. And like any relationship, it has to have a strong foundation. Because um, if you don't have a strong foundation, students don't feel safe. And then when you force them to do group work, it's just not the work of personality or conflict. Um, I also do a lot of breakout rooms discussion, a lot of breakout room discussion. Um, it may not be the optimal environment for that, but I always do that to allow students who may, you know, may be a little bit more intro introverted uh, to participate in a smaller group discussion. Um, also, a person who may be more talkative to kind of you know step back, uh, allow others step forward. Uh, but it, it 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 is a challenge. You could you know uh, put up games or activities uh, to kind of change up your your teaching. 
the online community is, is, is really, really, really challenging. Uh, an example can be where, you know, while teaching uh, and, you know, many professor has different viewpoint as is, if everyone's face is off, mic is off, I only see myself speaking. So it be also becomes a challenge as, as well. Uh, so I'm personally, you know, flexible for, you know, uh, the need for online, but, you know, at the end of the day, I'm one that teaching has happened in person interaction. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, this is a reflection based on um, one of the questions that you that you just responded to. Um, how can we contribute to community when we kind of feel like there isn't one? Being in Stockton, I feel this way and I don't see much of it. I appreciate that question. Um, you know, it is hard uh, to create community uh, when you don't see yourself in, in, in positions of leadership. So I'll give an example, you know, here in Sacramento, and I'll answer your question, driving down 99 to, to Stockton. So when you look at MetaView, uh, it's a community here in Sacramento, South Side. It's red line and divided by I-5. Right across is a pocket area. Pocket area, beautiful homes, very rich people, I would say. You don't see no fast food restaurant in the pocket area. They drive over 99 to come to that Shell and that McDonald and MetaView. MetaView has Home Depot, Walmart, Chick-fil-A, tons of uh, fast food. So when you see that have and have not, it becomes very, very, very challenging. But one of the easiest way is creating your own neighborhood watch group, doing block parties, uh, getting to know your neighbors, um, that's a low hanging fruit to build community. Uh, it is very hard when you can't build community beyond your neighborhood. Absolutely, it's extremely hard because you're not seen, you don't feel belong beyond your block. Uh, so I encourage folks to run for city council. You know, we can have as much passion and grit and advocacy, but if it does not translate to policy, is dead on arrival. So I encourage folks to run for city council, get involved with policy. The policy as a city council member, you're gonna be able to allocate and advocate for resources to build a park, to build a pool, ice skating rink. That's how you build community is when there's a shared space that different groups could come to. Look in many neighborhoods, they don't have a park. They don't have a library. These are all, you know, communal places that foster community. But if you don't have that, it's extremely hard to foster community because there's not a time that you come together, whether you're black, white, Asian, you're poor, you're homeless, there's not a place that you come together to foster community. So having a library advocating for park, for ice skater ring, tennis court, because why is it that other neighborhood has all of this and certain neighborhoods don't? It comes from policy. Yeah, thank you. I would also love to say join student groups on campus because mm -hmm. a lot of the student groups on campus, you know, are are open to new ideas for how to bring, um, you know, the campus into the community and, and uh, you know, how to identify issues that are very particular to you at be, living in Stockton, knowing, you know, what the issues here that are of importance and, and then connect, reach out more with people on campus because there are student groups that, you know, need uh, a participation and need minds to come together. So thank you. Thank you so much for that. Okay. Well, um, I'm not seeing any more questions in the chat. Are there any more comments or questions um, for Dr. Vang? We'll give you, you know, one last chance to ask questions or post or ask, or you can even just raise your hand and Speak out loud if you'd like. I have one question. Um, well, not necessarily a question, but if you could leave um, this, this presentation and leave our participants 
with a, a message of hope. And that's one thing that I feel is really necessary. I moved here to Stockton and I love Stockton, by the way. I've been here for almost a year and a half now. And I'm very, very, uh, feel very fortunate to have made this move um, when I was hired here at Delta. And I see so much promise in the, the communities, in the people, and for the future. But for in your own words, if you could leave us with some words of hope and inspiration um, to the Stockton people and communities. You know, first, I want to thank you, Dr. Hollenstein, Dr. Willman, for having me. You know, I tell folks, I'll reach to me. You know, I'm no one special. I'm from Stockton. I go to the food truck in Stockton. I walk in the street of Stockton. Uh, but I'm privileged to be doing the work I'm doing here at Sacramento in the state. You know, gratitude is so important to me. Gratitude is so important to me. Uh, so one uh, thing I will leave to you all is uh, if you're feeling gratitude, uh, if you're thinking about gratitude, uh, you must express it because, you know, feeling gratitude and not expressing their gratitude towards an individual, a group, or someone you love, it's like wrapping a present with this holiday season and not giving it. OK, so feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Uh, positive words coming right back at you. Thank you for being so inspirational. This presentation is going to be shared with students. There's so many gems that you've shared. And for everybody online, this presentation is going to be available on our YouTube profiles in equity and excellence video series. And we will be sharing the link as soon as we're able to download it and get it published. So campus community, look out for the video. It will be forthcoming. And thank you so much, Dr. Vang, for being an inspiration, you know, a homeboy, a true Stockton <laughs> homeboy, a success story. and and. Thank you so much. Immense gratitude. Thank you. Immense gratitude. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Right. Happy holidays, everyone. Same. Happy okay. holidays. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hey, everyone. Correct. Have a wonderful holiday season, everyone. Wonderful winter break. Yes. Thank you for joining us. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you for joining us for session three of Profiles in Equity and Excellence. We hope you'll join us again on January 24th for our next featured speaker. Peace be with you all.